All right, I want to start by saying that this webinar has been requested by um, a teacher, and I, I think it's about time that we have this one. Teaching electrical wiring was one of my favorite lessons in the classroom because it's uh, you could literally see the lights come on in your student's face, and even though the material uh, after several years in the classroom is, is the same material, the students still make it really special. And you can literally walk out of the door and use what you learned right away. You start looking at, at your switches different in your home. When you turn on the ba uh, bathroom light every morning, you kind of know what's going on behind the circuit. When you plug something into your GFI, you know what's going on. And, and I really think the more knowledge you have about the world around you, uh, the more powerful of a student you are and the better, uh, the better off you'll be. I always told my students that uh, you don't have to learn this if you promise to never use electricity. I also used to reinforce my students the money that they could save by doing their own uh, small electrical projects like changing out a switch and a light bulb. So we're going to forego today how electricity is made, how it's um, created at the power plant and how it's transformed and traveled over great distances and how it comes into the home. We're going to forego a lot of that and kind of focus on this drawing of our CDE circuits and we'll go over kind of how uh, best practices of teaching the material. So when I taught this, I was on block schedule and uh, from day one, I promised my kids we would do 45 minutes of electrical theory and drawing and 45 minutes of hands-on work from day one. And that's what we did. And as, as one of the examples of things that we did uh, from day one, we made terminal loops. And the mentors that taught me electrical wiring made me do this as a young teacher at FFA camp when they were telling me uh, how, how to teach this in my classroom. So we'll go over that really briefly. I've got a, a set of tools here. This is a pair of uh, multi-purpose wire tool and we'll go over how to make a what we call a terminal loop so vocabulary and terminology is very important when we talk about electrical wiring you're basically learning a new vocabulary that that changes regionally um, but for for most practical purposes most people call this a terminal loop and you have to bear with me here i'm using a camera where i can't really see my hands i'm using my laptop that's laid down on my bare desk or i don't have direct eye contact with my hands other than through the through my computer monitor. It's kind of weird. So three quarters of an inch is the proper the proper amount of length to make the proper terminal loop. You, three quarters of an inch of uh, casing taken off of what we call the Romex here. And so whenever you have that, I like to use um, pliers. Needle nose pliers like to grab the end of the wire and bend it around and you know you have a good terminal loop and this is not a good one as a teacher whenever you're grading these sorts of things you know you've got a good one whenever the the end of the loop which is here matches the end of the Romex which is here and this one's a little short so when it was to go under a connection say here you can see that there would be some copper showing and so we don't want that. We want to teach our kids from day one how to make a proper terminal loop. And one of the reasons this one isn't proper is because it's longer than three quarters of an inch. And as a, a great way to measure three quarters of an inch for kids that are just getting started, it's usually about the distance of your thumbnail from one end to the other. So you can see mine is a little long. And you can't really make a proper terminal loop if the wire is too long. So we're going to cut this one down closer to three quarters of an inch. And I'll show you uh, some of these tools, um, whenever you buy them, they have holes on each side. And one thing these guys do with those is actually use it to bend around and make the terminal loop with the pliers. I need, I need to finish this one up. Didn't quite get it all the way around. So here we have a terminal loop where the end of the end of the loop matches the end of the casing and that one should go underneath the uh, connection fairly well. Terminal loops, I always made my kids make 20 of them and they had to be perfect and turn it in for a grade. So when we did uh, our first 45 minutes in class and they were bored of hearing how electricity is made and transported and how uh, 
travels through conductors and all that sort of electron theory stuff so from day one we would go into the shop and start making terminal loops so it's a really good idea to keep a lot of scrap wire around for that first few weeks of class so that you have some material and you're not wasting good wire on uh, making those sorts of things. Next thing students need to learn how to do is making what we call a pigtail. Let me cut another piece of wire here. So consequently to make a, a good pigtail you need at least three quarters of wire stripped away from the insulation. And you need two pairs of good linemen. So you need one to hold, and these are these are lineman pliers. You need one to hold and one to twist with. I'm gonna hold with this one and put those wires right beside one another. I'm gonna come in with these. I'm gonna grab them toward the end, grab the connection toward the end, and I'm gonna begin to twist to my right. I tell my kids if you like to fish and you fish with a a pole where you reel with your right hand, it's the same direction that you reel with, except you're twisting your pliers in that direction. So I'm going to twist these about six to seven times. Where we have a nice tight pigtail, but before the insulation begins to tear underneath the pliers that are holding it. Now, it's really important that you make your kids hold it in the right place. You don't want them holding way back here because then the Romex actually begins to twist. You don't want them holding it too close. You don't want to allow them to strip three inches of wire to make a pigtail because uh, especially in the CDE, you're gonna lose points for, for not being efficient. And I like to clip off the end. You want the pigtail to be completely hidden by a wire connector. So if I put my wire connector in and twist it, you won't be able to see copper in this area. That's what we're looking for. You want to twist it to the right so that it's going in the same direction as the threads on the wire nut. And I know these are basic rules. These are things that um, you think are great to, to add into your teaching as you go along with the drawings and with the wiring of the circuits, but these are really the, the ABCs of electrical wiring. These are good job skills. These are good things for kids to learn. And it's a great way to uh, engage kids in your shop with hands-on learning from day one of class. I would make kids make 20 of these individually, not as a team. Even though they would work in pairs with only one set of tools, they had to make them individually and turn them in. They'd cut them off short, put them on your desk, and move on to the next one. So that's another skill that kids need to learn. And once they... Uh, could do 20 of those we would advance to the pigtail with a jumper wire included and this one is a, a little more difficult I'll just use these three uh, red wires to demonstrate how to make the pigtail with the jumper wire and we're going to start talking about jumpers uh, today in our circuitry so this is an important skill for kids to uh, to work on early early in the semester so we start again with our three quarters inch removing of the insulation on the third wire which are usually represents the jumper wire we're going to do quite a bit more we're going to take off uh, I might have taken off a little too much right there but we're going to take off an extra amount so we're going to put the two three quarter inch wires together and treat them as one wire we're going to lay wire number three across them and treat it as the second wire so there's our two. We're going to treat those as one. Here's our jumper wire. We're going to lay it across. And we're going to grab that again with our alignment pliers. I really suggest to teachers that you don't buy cheap lineman pliers. Buy you a good set. If you do buy cheap ones, buy half of them to hold wires with and the other half buy good quality uh, pliers to twist with. And good quality pliers are normally don't have big teeth right here on this before the cutting blade. They, this is, these are good quality pliers because you can see the small teeth. The uh, cheaper the pliers get, normally the bigger those teeth get and that they're a little more cumbersome to hold wires with. So whenever we get this set up, we want to once again grab all three wires 
and twist it just like we're fishing again in that same direction. This is a, a little difficult for left-handed kids, so you got to work with them a little differently. They'll tend to want to twist to the left, but it's, it's important that even lefties learn how to twist to the right. And so when I grab all three wires, I want to incorporate them. And what they basically do here is braid all three wires together. So the way you grade this, is when the kids, uh, I usually made one in class, or I made several in class to demonstrate, and I would re-demonstrate as, as necessary, but I would let them uh, basically judge their wires off of mine. And, and of course, you want to trim off the excess here to make it look better. But I said, when yours look as good as mine, you can turn it in. And that one is not a, a grand champion by any means, but all three wires are braided together, and that's that would be an uh, A-quality pigtail with a jumper wire in my opinion and if they could make 20 of those then they could advance on the wire in their first circuit so they cut it off short lay it on the desk and move on to the next one and that was literally a uh, 100 point grade so those are some wiring skills that, that I suggest you incorporate very early in your teaching and don't wait until you go into the shop and start working on wiring to introduce kids to this skill I would literally begin this on day one whenever I was a teacher. It got kids engaged. They, they, they kind of liked the class more. And whenever we got to wiring, I didn't have to worry about quality issues when it came to making terminal loops, pigtails, and uh, jumper wires. And you, you teach that terminology reciprocally throughout the course of the week. And then when you get to wiring, you're not introducing a whole new set of language that confuses them. So we'll go over wire real quickly. This is 14 gauge wire as indicated on the Romex and also as indicated by the color. Uh, one thing you'll want to take note of on our circuits as we move forward with our course is that 14 gauge equals 15 amp circuits. And 20 gauge wire, uh, excuse me, 12 gauge wire I have to use a pen because I just broke that color pencil. 12 gauge wire is used for 20 amp circuits. Most of the circuits we'll do today are lighting circuits, which call for 15 amp breakers, and we'll be using 14 gauge wire. But we will use some 12 gauge wire whenever we talk about 20 amp circuitry. Um, we have inside the wires, we have coated wires and un uncoated ground wire. So We'll indicate the wire that has a, a, a black wire for hot and a white wire for neutral as 14.2 with ground. Those that have three wires, as this one does, I'll pull all three of them out where you can see. All right, so in here we have black, red, white, and then a bare copper with a paper sheath around it. This would be 14.3 WG. And you go, well, there's more than three wires in there. And that's correct. We have three coated wires with ground, two coated wires with ground. And there's a lot of mileage on teaching about wires and, and what's going on here. Basically, uh, everybody needs to know that the copper inside this black coated wire is the exact same copper as inside this white coated wire as is the same exact copper as in this red coated wire. The copper is the same. The color falls under the need to be safe and to have a national electric code and to follow that code so that everyone uses these colors the same way, whether we're wiring in Louisiana or we're wiring in Michigan or Washington DC or California, we're gonna use this black wire for a load wire or a hot wire. We're going to use this white wire as a neutral wire or return wire to the bus bar. And we can also use this red wire as a hot wire. And we'll use the bare copper only as a safety ground. So that's the color code of 14.3. And for 14.2, we just have a, a hot and a return. On our devices, we're going to be using light switches and lights today. We have some different colored screws on there that students need to become aware of because we're going to represent 
these two devices today on our paper, and I think it's important that you see the actual devices before we start drawing them and talking about them uh, in an abstract way. So here they are in concrete. On this lighting fixture, Portland lighting fixture, we have a brass colored screw, and I just call it a chrome or silver colored screw. And that's important because the brass colored screw is going to receive the hot wire or the the black wire will always be connected here and our neutral or return wire will always be connected to the silver or, or chrome colored screw and that's very important a switch only lets hot uh, only lets electricity in one side of it and out the other so both of these screws will be brass and therefore they'll be indicated as hot screws um, on your receptacle your brass has a side, is your hot side, which is the, the skinny side of the uh, receptacle. That's the hot side. And then your longer side here of the receptacle is tied to your neutral screws or chrome. So it's very, I always told my kids that the black wire goes to the brass colored screw and the, the black and the brass, black on brass seem to help them memorize where those things go. So. That's a, a 40,000 foot view of what you should know before you start wiring up an electrical board or drawing an electrical board. And I'm sure I missed a lot of, of a good teaching opportunity there to go over breakers and breaker boxes and service panels and things of that nature. But the teacher asked me to help with drawings, and that's what I'm going to do over the next three days. But before I could just go right into drawing a bunch of electrical circuits, I think that bit of information needed to be covered. So we're going to start with a circuit that never shows up in the contest, although it could. Um, it's, it's just too basic. It's too elementary. I've never seen it show up as a standalone problem. But this is where I think we need to start with our uh, electricity drawings. And I've always started with this drawing because that's what my mentor taught me. This is where we start. This is the ABCs of electrical wiring. And from here, everything we'll learn will compound and, and grow and come back to the lessons we've learned today based on this one circuit. So here's our service panel on our board. Here's our octagonal metal junction box that holds light fixtures or can just be used to join wires. Um, in, a, in an attic or what have you. We call it an octagonal because it has eight sides, junction box. And so our first circuit, I'm going to say number one here, is going to be a hot full chain light. Doesn't get any simpler than this. You can still buy full chain lights. I don't have one today. Uh, I stole a bunch of Dr. Blackburn's devices from LSU and, and borrowed some tools from Grant FFA this morning to put together this uh, webinar today, and, and none of them had a pull chain light, but you can still buy light fixtures that have a built-in switch and a little chain on here that you would pull and turn the light on and off. I don't know of any new buildings or new homes that uh, desire those, but I know in a lot of closets in, in homes built after World War II, we see a lot of pull chain lights. My grandmother had them in her house, and I can vividly remember pulling on the string that was attached to the chain to turn on the light. So. We're going to draw that circuit now. One hot pull chain light. So we're going to draw this first. These two lines represent 14.2 WG. I should specify up here that the circuit is 15 amp. And I'll do that sometimes. I'll have to bounce back and forth and, and add to it because I'm teaching material that I haven't sat and really taught for a couple years now. So this is a 15 amp circuit of a hot pull chain light. This first run of wire we're going to refer to as our source cable. You'll probably need to write that down because you're going to hear it a lot. You'll see that a lot in the uh, electricity CDE. The wire that carries the load or the first hot wire coming from the breaker is going to be considered the source cable. Inside 14.2, we discussed earlier, there's a black wire, and I'm just going to draw these. I'm not going to connect them yet. I'm going to draw them on each end. A white wire, which since we have white paper, 
we can't represent a white wire with a white colored pencil, so we've always used blue in the, in the history of our program. And I hope that uh, through this webinar, through this camera, that you guys can see the difference between the blue and the black. And I'll, I'll do my best to make sure that I, I make them separate enough so that you can. And then we're going to draw that bare copper wire with a green colored pencil. For, so for today, those are the three colors um, that we'll use. All right. And on the other end of this wire, we'll also have the load, the neutral of the return, and the green. Notice I didn't draw the wires all the way through the Romex. And that's an important thing to know because it would it would cover up the 14-2 that we wrote right here. And it's not what you see in the real world. Whenever we run Romex, you only see the colors sticking out of the working end. As this runs through studs and walls and comes up through your, your, your boxes that are attached to your studs, you, you don't see... Uh, you don't, you don't, we don't run individual wires, so you can't see the black wire running through here or the red wire or the white wire. So we draw it the same way. And that looks neater for the judges. I, I have seen kids that actually drew it this way and just drew the wires all the way through the middle uh, early on in my classes. And I would always correct that. I would take points off for that because that's not the way it should be drawn. It should be drawn with the Romex first, label the Romex, and then draw the wires as they come out of the other end of the cable. This is a 15 amp circuit, so we're going to connect the black wire to the 15 amp breaker. We're going to connect the white wire to the neutral bar. And on its own screw, on its separate screw, we're going to connect the bare copper wire to the neutral bar. And that's really important. We can't connect more than one wire underneath screws. They have to have their own individual screw. I bought a house in the last year that was built in the late 70s, and it had several wires underneath these screws and we did a home inspection before we bought the house and the home inspector told us that we need to demand that that, that, that be changed and it did we got that we got a new bus bar put in and, and got that fixed so uh, today's code will not allow the sharing of, of more than or sharing of any wires under a single screw so make sure you draw it that way as well this lighting fixture is going to be represented on our paper and I wrote source cable right in the way of where I need to draw this. I'm going to draw it over here a little bit. It's going to be designated by a circle with a dark colored circle representing the brass screw and then just a, a regular circle representing the neutral wire. And what we'll do is we'll connect that. These devices are made of porcelain or plastic, and therefore they do not conduct electricity, so there is nowhere to, to connect a ground to. There's nowhere to connect the bare copper wire. However, in this particular box, it's metal, and anything metal needs to be grounded, so we will hook our ground wire to the metal box. When we run wire circuitry into this round junction box it'll be made of plastic and this is actually a typo i need to take this off of this drawing we've had it on here for years there is not a ground screw on this plastic box because it doesn't conduct electricity and whenever we draw a lighting fixture above this box there is nowhere to ground to as well so what we've been doing is just we don't cut the bare copper wire off in this circuit we just leave it in the box uh, basically unused and there's a lot of there's a lot of teaching about why we ground and the, the history of uh, uh, grounding safely. Um, and we're just going to have to bypass that today for the sake of efficiency. Uh, the fact I've got the, the high school class into the webinar for 32 more minutes, um, we could talk about grounding. I know my mentor, Steve Vines, could, could give you a lecture on grounding um, that would take up three class periods. And we'll just skip that for now. This is your first circuit. This is a hot pull chain light where the, the breaker actually and the pull chain, I guess I could draw that here. Um, I'll draw a little chain coming off of here and that'll represent, that'll represent the fact that there's no switch. So the switch would be built into the device 
and you could also throw the breaker to shut the switch down. Let's look at the schematic. This is the part that uh, this is the part that it lured me for years, and, and it's still uh, have a a lot of defined um, de defined uh, symbols. But let me give you mine. So we're always going to start with a source, which is going to be represented by a dot. We're going to go through a breaker, which is represented by the ohm sign, and we'll label that breaker 15 amp in this case. From that schematic. I like to teach my kids to always draw down, and we'll come to why uh, in our next circuit. So I always like to branch down and then go into the light. The light can be represented simply by a circle and an L. And then we will come out of that with a dotted line and represent the return with a dotted line instead of a solid line, which we represent the hot wire with the solid line and then the dash line is, represent, is representing the neutral wire, and then we'll go to ground. So the schematic represents the flow of electricity from the source to the ground. So let's follow that. Electricity comes into this breaker panel from our uh, meter box outside through our weather head back through the transformer that ties to the main line, that ties to the other substation that goes all the way back to the power plant. But it comes here as a 110 volt feed. It comes out of this breaker, Whenever the switch is on, the electricity will travel across the filament and it'll come back through the neutral wire unloaded to this neutral bar, which is connected to a ground cable outside where the electricity literally goes uh, unloaded to the ground. We will be adding to the schematic and we're gonna add from here. I guess I'll take a second uh, and see if anybody has any questions on what, what I've done so far before we move on to the next drawing. All right, hearing none, let's go to the next drawing, which is going to be two hot pull chain lights. Let me check my phone here. Hunter King is texting me. All right, 10 4. All right, so. Slide L high is good so far. We'll keep moving on. So we're going to add two lights. We're going to do two pull chain lights, 15 amp breaker, which means we're going to use 14 gauge wire. And now we're going to have two lights being fed straight from the breaker. Can't really add on to this drawing, and you'll you'll understand why in a second. We can't just add on um, a second light. We have to do a, a whole other drawing. So as a teacher, I suggest you make about 500 copies of this and have them readily available so that kids can make mistakes and get a fresh copy because you add all these colors and lines and drawings and start scratching things out and it can get ugly pretty quick. Just make a big stack. Go to We had a, a risograph when I was in the classroom and I would literally go a week before school started and I'd make a thousand copies of this diagram and have them in my office. For, and they would usually make the whole year um, for my class and the CDE. So if we're doing hot pull chain lights, we know we have to go to the light fixtures first. So our source cable is going to go to the first octagonal box. And then out of that box, we're going to pigtail onto that hot wire and that neutral wire and put our second light fixture here. Notice I'm not drawing any wires. I'm drawing the circuit problem first. I'm drawing the two lights. First, I know because of the uh, simulated board that we use that I only have two light boxes. So I'm going to draw two light fixtures above two light boxes. I'm going to draw the Romex first that I need to make that circuit happen. And I think kids get confused sometimes trying to connect the wires too soon. So teach them to draw the run first, and maybe you can check that and give them the thumbs up and say, hey, if you if you know what you're doing from this point on, you've ran your Romex correctly, now run your wires and, and finish the circuit. And this is a good, uh, a, a good place to start. So the break box you're going to see is wired pretty much the same time, uh, same way every time, with few exceptions. You're going to have a hot wire going to a breaker. You're going to have a neutral wire 
going to um, go into the neutral bar and then you'll have the ground. And I'd also like to discuss ground. This will be the last circuit where I'm actually going to draw the ground wire. And you'll appreciate this later. Um, adding this green wire as we start to get into circuits that have a lot going on, this green wire can tend to confuse kids. If you got kids that are advanced, if you got kids that are, that are in the CDE, they're going to have to draw the ground wire. But if, if you want to differentiate your instruction, if you want to make it to where it's not as confusing for your uh, general students, then we'll eliminate the ground wire. And I did that for years. Only kids that, that drew grounds were the kids that wanted to compete in the FFA event. And the reason, um, the one way you can justify that is the ground does the same thing every time. No matter the circuit, the ground wire is going to ground to this screw. If we're down here in these switch boxes, it's going to ground uh, to either the switch box or the device itself. All of your devices that carry electricity will have a green ground screw. So once you've covered a few circuits with this, and by the way, when they wire the circuit in the shop on the board, it, just because they didn't draw the ground wire, they still have to ground everything properly. It's very important that we teach our kids how to properly ground. But you'll see later, especially around circuit 10 or 11, this ground wire can just make things really confusing visually to see. And, um, you know, we're not making a, a grand champion electricity uh, CDE competitor out of, out of all our students. So, you know, I taught a lot of... Of, of students that it just seemed to be better if eventually we got away from drawing the ground, even though we still grounded things uh, on our boards. And that was another bit of advice that my mentor gave me, and it, that turned out to be good, solid advice uh, from teaching, teaching many years and teaching as many as 25 kids at a time uh, this lesson. So now I've got one source, and I've got two devices that need electricity. So I can't just go here and then take the hot wire out of here and put two wires underneath one screw. Remember, that's wrong. We can't do it. And go back to where we learned earlier how to twist three wires together, and we talked about the concept of a jumper wire. We're going to use that concept now. We're going to draw a jumper wire to where we can share electricity to both of these lights in a parallel circuit. And there's a lot of mileage that we'll bypass on parallel and series circuitry. I'll share some things when we get to the schematic on this. So the first thing kids need to learn how to do when you've got two devices that need electricity, the first thing you got to do with your hot wire is curl it out. Let's just curl it out and leave it there as if we were running this wire in the house. You know, a lot of times we pull wire and there's, there's no sheetrock, there's no devices to wire to, right? So a lot of times we just pull wire, we, we, pull it through the box, strip the Romex off, and leave it hanging for weeks or months until the sheetrock goes up and the device fixtures are picked out, the colors of the light switches are picked out, and then we may hook devices up. We may hook light, uh, light fixtures up months later. So let's just pretend we're doing that. We're pulling the wire. We know we're going to need that wire to hook up to these two lights later, and we'll just pull it out there and leave it alone. Likewise, we will need our neutral wire for two different neutrals, so we're going to curl it out and leave it alone as well. We can go ahead and draw our ground. We got a ground wire coming out of here and a ground wire coming out of here. We can't tie them together and call that grounded. Uh, so we're going to curl that out as well. And we'll connect them, but we're also going to jump them to that screw. So here's that jumper wire we talked about earlier. I got two wires that we could pigtail together we cut a piece of about eight inch uh, ground wire, scrap ground wire, and add it to the pigtail, put underneath the wire nut, and um, let's see, I'll draw that here. Put underneath a red wire nut. And so there's our jumper wire concept that we talked about earlier. We're gonna do that same thing here. So what I like to do is go, uh, we know there's only two wires or three wires in this Romex. We know there is a, a ground wire, which we're gonna leave hanging in this case because there's nothing to ground to. There's a hot wire and there's a neutral wire. So I'm gonna go ahead and hook those up. I'm gonna go ahead and hook those up. And where they come out, I'm going to connect here and then run my jumper wire right there. And I'll put that underneath the red wire now. And I'm gonna take my hot wire here, connect it to the source. 
take a jumper wire and jump it to the white. Put that underneath the red wire now. And undoubtedly in the classroom you're sitting in right now, above your head are a lot of lights controlled by one switch. Whenever you walk in the room, in my office I have two big ballasts, and when I turn the switch on, both of those ballasts come on. Uh, and you probably have the same thing in your classroom where you're sitting at now. This is what's going on inside the junction boxes above your head. We are sharing this source cable, jumping to the light at hand, and moving on to the next light through another uh, bit of Romex. On and on and on until you get to the last one on the line, it'll be the only one that looks like this. So this is a really interesting concept for you to understand moving forward. Whenever you open up a junction box overhead and you see all this going on, you'll make more sense of it as this course goes on, every circuit we do, we'll do one light and then we'll do two lights. So whenever we add a switch here in a moment, we'll do a switch to a single light, switch to a double light. When we learn three ways in a couple days, we'll do a three-way switch circuit to one light and three-way switch circuit to two lights, just to reiterate that knowledge of how to use this jumper wire and share. And if you can do it with two lights, you can do it with 200. The process just continues down the line. We only do it with two on our board, but th this concept remains consistent all throughout a, you know, a big build like what's going on overhead. This is how we share that feed. Let's look at it schematically. This is where we can talk uh, terms of series and parallel circuits. So we're going to start with a source again. We're going to go through a breaker. This time it was 15 amp. And we're going to go down. Remember, I said I like for my students to learn that you always kind of make a a hockey stick here, an L, and that keeps us from drawing a series circuit. Since we shared feed over here, we're going we're gonna to symbolize that with another dot, and that allows us to come out with another solid line for two hot feeds or legs in parallel. And, and we use the term parallel because they're running parallel with each other, obviously. We will signify the first light with an L, Signify the second light with an L. And then over here, we'll draw individual lines to ground. And that may not be the best way to show that. We could also connect them here with a dot and a dash line going to ground. Here's the concept. And I'll get clarification on this. Um, go back in my notes and make sure we want to draw our grounds correctly as well. But it, don't miss this important concept. If this light bulb goes out, if this light bulb burns out, this light has its own trace back to the breaker. So this is a parallel circuit. If this light bulb goes out, consequently this one is sharing feed that goes all the way back to the original source or comes out of the breaker. So these lights are independent of each other. Now I'm going to draw, I'm going to flip my paper over, and I did that a lot when I was teaching this. I'm going to draw a series circuit. I'm going to draw a source. I'm going to come over and I'm going to draw a light. And out of the, the neutral of that light, instead of drawing a neutral line, a dash line, I'm going to draw a solid line to the next light. I'm going to draw a solid line to the next light. And now I'll draw my neutral wire to ground, neutral wire to ground. The issue with this is we're using the neutral side for a feed to the next light. So if any of these bulbs go out, we have an open circuit and every bulb goes out. So the reason we wire in parallel, and I'll use a different piece of paper to demonstrate what's going on here. We've got a source, a breaker. We're going to split that source and show that with a dot and come down. L. We'll split that source again and come down. L. We split this as many times as we want to. We'll connect them like this. So we'll have a dot here and a dot here and we'll go to ground. That should be a better way to represent uh, sharing different wires to go to ground. If any of these go out, these will stay lit. This is a parallel circuit. 
And this is a series circuit. This old series circuit is what we used to see in old Tommy Christmas lights. Whenever one bulb went out, you had to find it and change it so that the circuit would come back on. Uh, series circuits is used in a lot of electrical uh, devices, um, interior circuitry, and that's not the proper term, but, but um, electronics, let's say that. We use a lot of series things with diodes and rectifiers and electronics uh, inside our laptops, inside our, well, none of you kids use stereos anymore, but um, series is used, just not for electrical wiring. Let me check my phone. Hunter was texting me here. That wasn't Hunter, that was somebody else. All of our circuits will always be parallel. So it's good to teach your kids from the get-go to do this and not get in the um, habit of doing something like this. This is a no-no. All right. So there's two hot pull chain lights straight from the breaker. Now, also, whenever we would draw a circuit, we can wire it. So we're talking about it in the abstract. We can grade the paper and then go to the shop and use their paper to actually wire the circuit watch the light come on. And of course we're skipping all that, but I suggest that you do that perfect mix of teaching uh, with doing it on paper and then going to the shop and actually doing it on the board. And that's where you demand those uh, wiring skills. You know, um, you, you teach kids how to do things really neatly. And once again, I'm skipping a lot of mileage on how to pull wire, how to take the proper amount of wire out of these boxes, how to use your tools correctly to to strip the Romex off and how to make it look neat. We're skipping a lot of things by just doing this on the uh, on the drawings, but we can only do so much with the uh, technology and the time that we have. We're gonna add a switch to the circuit. And by adding that switch, we're gonna um, control when the lights come on and off. Uh, away from the device. Remember the pull chain light, the, the switch is actually built in to the light fixture. Now we're going to add a switch, which we all use every day. This is a single pole. Single throw switch. Most of the time we refer to it as a simple switch. So what's going on inside there? Inside here, I want to kind of illustrate that. Inside the single pole, single throw switch, which has on and off, by the way. You have an on and an off, so you know when the pole is thrown, when the circuit is open and when it's closed. So you have this essentially going on inside this switch. Between these two hot lugs on the switch. Inside them you have an on-off switch that either opens the circuit, this is an open circuit, which is off by the way, or you actually flip the switch and the pole closes and you have this action going on inside the switch. This is a closed circuit and for all practical purposes, whatever this switch is controlling would be on. So that's an important concept to understand here. Here's another really important concept I want students to understand. Whenever you come out of the breaker, and you come into this side, and you come out of this side to the light, this switch will work the same as if you came out of the breaker and you went to this side, and then this side went over here to the light. Doesn't matter. It's hot in and hot out. So when you're wiring this, it'll make more sense when you actually get to the board. Uh, Undoubtedly, your students are going to go, well, which black wire do I hook to this screw? Which one? The one coming from the light or the one coming from the breaker? That tends to be a little confusing to them. So if you show them on paper where it really doesn't matter. When, and we flip this over and we start drawing the wires, you'll see, uh, you'll see more of what I'm talking about. So let's do that. I've got 10 minutes left for you, Mr. King. I think we'll get this done. Um, 
we may be able to, to speed up and do one light and then do two. So this one's going to be called 15 amp circuit uh, with a light control button. I'm going to abbreviate CB, one location. That's the typical jargon used in the CDE. We want a 15 amp circuit with a light control by one location. That tells you to use a simple switch, also known as a single pole, single throw switch. So if we're doing that, we have to come. Oh, and we're going to specify that the source cable goes to the switch box. That's a, that's a curveball I'm going to throw you tomorrow. Source cable is going to go to the switch box rather than the junction box this time. This is the simplest way to do this circuit. So source cable is going to the switch box. I'm going to draw that first. That's the most important thing. If I don't do that correctly, I'm really not following the judge's problem. I can lose some major points by not following what they say to do. So I'm going to go to the switch box, 14.2WG. I'm going to come out of the switch box to control the light by drawing the Romex first and then labeling it as well. Once again, I'm not trying to connect colors or any of that yet. I'm drawing the skeleton of the circuit. I'm drawing the devices first. A switch is represented by a rectangle with a little switch built onto it. And then notice here, I don't have that neutral colored screw, right? I have uh, just the two black screws. Also, we'll stop drawing uh, grounds from this point forward, but if you're getting ready for the CDE, what I suggest you do, um, you have a, a place to ground to right here, but if you're in these plastic boxes, you'll actually draw a ground screw either on the top or the bottom of the switch. That'll, that'll be necessary for your kids that are advancing on to compete in the event. As I was teaching this, I would use an overhead projector or an Elmo, we call it, or a document camera. And in my classroom, I would draw all of these circuits every year. I would never expect a kid to come into my class and be able to complete this without a lot of help. And after circuit 10 or 12, uh, I would start to wean myself off and just make them, or actually even sooner than that, maybe circuit five or six, I would put the problem on the board, draw the devices, and let them start to, to fill in this part, right? and then see if somebody could get it right in the class. So I didn't just spoon feed the class every circuit for the entire year. There's no fun in that of just being the person that uh, gives out all that information every day and they rely on you to solve all, all of their problems. Uh, but I do enjoy drawing these and I, and, and I like to sharpen my skills every year and, and, and make sure I did the first, um, first ones just basically they, they don't have the skills necessary at this point to start solving these problems a few will you'll run across some students that do uh, but the majority will still need a lot of help in these early stages of drawing and so be prepared to draw a lot of these in the early stages of the class so our breaker box is going to look like this pretty standard we're going to go to the switch with our source I'm going to go ahead and draw the other, the other uh, hot wire coming off of the hot side of the switch, or the, the other side of the switch, rather. And that is going to go to the hot side of the light. So when we turn electricity on, it'll travel through this breaker, through this wire, into the top side of the switch. If we throw the switch on, the electricity will travel down to this screw, and whatever's connected to this screw will then become hot, which would be our filament or... Uh, now with the new lights, they don't really have filaments, but whatever that is inside the gas or however it works, if the light is on, electricity will travel across that light and go to the neutral side, which will travel back to the neutral bar through these series of um, white wires. And let me I don't have a yellow, I do not have a yellow marker, but you would want a yellow wire nut to connect that because it's only two wires. We usually use our red wire nut when we have a three wire connection. And so that's how that circuit would work. That is a 15 amp light controlled by one location with the source cable going to the switch box. So let's stay copacetic with what we discussed earlier. When we do one light, all we do is uh, our next circuit, rather than move on to a whole new concept, we're going to do two lights. 
control by one location. Uh, I can't write. And if the judge doesn't specify the amperage and we, it's a lighting circuit, we can assume that we'll use 14 gauge wire. I'm going to suggest 15 amp circuit here. Uh, most of the time they will. Um, 15 amps is going to be 14 gauge wire. We're going to run the source cable to the switch box. Also, you need to make sure you become familiar with the numbers of these boxes according to our CDE rules. And it is not one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's, it's a lot different. And three years ago, I could have told you, I could have named them right now. I'm not up to par on what, they're, what they are. You need to find in our rules this page and teach your kids the numbers of these boxes because a lot of times, instead of saying source to the switch box, it's going to tell you to run the source to box five. And you need to know what box five is. Um, I made all the way to state contest one year with a kid that got there, and we had never covered that. And he said, I didn't know where box number five was, so I ran the source cable all the way over here because he said, I counted one, two, three, four, five. And obviously that was incorrect. So make sure um, if you're competing or you're wanting to, to get to the com competitive level that you go to the website, find the rules, and learn the numbers of these boxes. So we're going to run our source cable to our switch box. We're going to run out of our switch box up here to our light because that's what our problem specified. We want two lights controlled by one location. Here's that one location. If we got two lights, then we need to run the Romex from this box to our second one. We're going to draw our devices. And I'm speeding up here a little bit, Hunter, because you got four minutes left according to my watch. And also tell your kids that it's completely fine if you're just copying down what I'm doing and you don't fully understand it, that makes you pretty normal, right? That, that's par for the course. Um, make sure they keep a folder and keep these in the classroom so that they don't lose them and you don't have to redraw them and that you keep a library of this stuff around so that they, eventually it'll click. And that's one of the things I really love about this class, eventually, but every student at some level, it may be on circuit number five, it may be circuit number 15, eventually it would click and they would start to pick it up and understand it. And that's why I really, really love teaching this course. So we're gonna run our source to, we can run it to this side of the switch or this side, it doesn't matter. It will still work no matter which one we choose. We'll run this one here. I'm going to do something a little advanced that, that might blow your mind. I'm going to draw this first, even though I'm not wiring it that way. I'm going to go ahead and get that out of the way while I'm here. Uh, it may be more beneficial for the kids to draw the circuit as it as the electricity flows from the breaker through here up to here, you know, but I'm, I'm going to skip around and just make it work. Since I've got two things to light up, I'm going to curl this out. I'm going to catch that feed over here and feed this, and then I'm gonna put my jumper wire there. I'm gonna do the same thing with my neutral there, and then I'll be electrified there. I'm gonna put this under red because it's three wire connections. Now let's go to the schematic. I'm gonna flip my paper over to draw the schematic a little larger because my, uh, to be quite honest with you, that that's a little bitty box and, and I don't have a very sharp colored pencil. So let's do the switch control the one light first. So we had a source, we have a breaker, and then we go into a switch. So a switch should look like this with the poles inside. We have uh, the source going to that circle. Don't just stop at the box, go all the way to the circle. It doesn't matter if the switch is open or closed. I'm going to leave it open. Uh, you shouldn't lose points for that in the schematic. We're going to one light, and even though we're not splitting the feed right here, uh, I guess it would be correct if we drew the light symbol. It just bothers me to do that. I want you to make an L. I want you to come down and draw your L like that. Do your dash line to ground like that. So if we're going to, to, uh, going to schematically represent this circuit, all we're doing is, is adding a second light. So I'm simply going to draw a dot here, and I'm going to add that second light. And then I'm going to draw that over to here and connect them with a dot as well. So they're sharing neutrals and they're sharing feed from there. And this was a 15 amp breaker. 
Hunter, I think this is a good stopping point for a group of high school kids. Uh, we'll pick up here tomorrow and blow your minds with moving the source cable around. We'll, we'll stick with the simple switches. We'll add receptacles um, and, and spend another good hour on circuitry tomorrow. We may do five or six of these. So make sure if you want to keep up and go along with me as I'm going, uh, you'll need those colored pencils and papers to do that. The good thing about this is we, we recorded the whole thing. And in a couple of days, we should have it up on our uh, on our YouTube channel and on the website. Are there any questions, Joey? If your kids want to hang around, we can go we can go a little further and dive a little deeper into this. I'll stop the recorder. You have been disconnected from the meeting.